Hi, my name is Francesca Frangudi, and I want to tell you about what we can learn by studying cosmological simulations about the formation and properties of the Milky Way's bulge and bar. So I want to start by saying uh, why I've clumped together the bulge and the bar in a conference that's about bulges. And that's because we know that the Milky Way is in fact a bar spiral galaxy. And we also know that bars can really affect the inner regions of their galaxies by redistributing gas and stars. For example, bars can cause shocks uh, in the gas that cause it to funnel to the center through the so-called dust lanes, where it accumulates in the central region, forming structures such as so-called nuclear disks, which are highly rotating structures are found in the central regions of galaxies. Bars can also form structures called um, X-shaped or boxy peanut-shaped bulges um, that are formed due to vertical resonances in the bar themselves. Now here I'm showing you a video of how such a boxy peanut bulge can form. So this is um, a simulation of a disk galaxy where you can see the, the stellar distribution face on and edge on at the bottom panel. And if I start the video, you see that after some time of evolution, the bar forms self-consistently. And I'm rotating the bar to always be along the x-axis. And that's because I want you to focus on the bottom panel here, where you'll see that after some time of the evolution of the bar, so I'm going to fast forward a bit here, you see that you form an x-shape or peanut-shaped bulge. So this is the bulge that forms uh, really through internal um, secular processes and disk instabilities, not through external processes. So because of all these effects that the bar has in the central regions of galaxies, the properties of the bar and the bulge um, in Milky Way-like galaxies are going to be tangled together or linked. Now to study all of this and disentangle all these different processes, we can use cosmological simulations, which are very useful for studying the formation evolution of galaxies, since we can trace um, this from high redshifts down to low redshifts, um, but also in the full cosmological context, so taking into account things like mergers and gas accretion, etc. And um, in this uh, talk, I'm going to be looking at the Auriga simulation. So this is a suite of 40 high-resolution cosmological zoom-in simulations that have a halo mass in the range of the mass of the Milky Way. Um, and they have a comprehensive galaxy formation evolution model, which has uh, star formation, solar feedback, feedback from AGN, and in which we can trace, for example, as you can see here, a dark matter, gas density, and solar distribution at the same time. And all of these galaxies form um, disdominated systems by redshift zero, and for example, in the case of the galaxy we're seeing here, so this is Auriga 18 that I'll come back to later, you see that um, by redshift one, you also already have um, a nice barred galaxy um, that's, that's formed. Also want to mention that there's another talk about bulges in Auriga in the conference by Ignacio Cariulo, so definitely go check that out as well. So what um, the cosmological simulations are telling us about the formation of bars is that um, these bars in Milky Way-like galaxies are already starting to form by about redshift of one to two. So this was already shown in Carl J. Catal in 2012, uh, where they looked at the bar fraction as a function of redshift. And you see that at about redshift of one, you start having an increase in the bar fraction in these galaxies. So this is also from cosmological simulations. And then in, in the Auriga simulations, we also see something similar. So we see that, um, this is now the x-axis is flipped, so high redshift is on the left. So you see that at about redshift of one, um, you already have about 20% uh, of uh, bars in these uh, Milky Way mass galaxies, and this increases um, to low redshifts. So in cosmological simulations of Milky Way mass galaxies, bars begin to form at redshifts of about one to two. And what we also see in these simulations is that once a bar forms, so what I'm showing you here is the bar strength as a function of look back time. So high redshifts on the left, low redshifts on the right here for this galaxy Auriga 18. What we see is that once a bar forms, the bar remains there. It does not self-destruct itself, but these bars are long lived uh, structures in cosmological simulations. Now, going back to the origin of bulges, um, we know that in the central regions of galaxies, we tend to find two different uh, kinds of structures. On the one hand, we have these so-called classical bulges, which are dispersion-dominated spheroids that are thought to form through rather violent processes, such as mergers um, or clump migration at high redshift. And on the other hand, we have um, these so-called pseudobulges, which include boxy peanuts or also the nuclear disks I was mentioning, that form through secular formation processes, so from um, disk instabilities and it's generally through in situ processes. So the question has always been, of course, you know, what kind of bulge is the Milky Way? Now, we now know, of course, that we have a boxy peanut bulge in the Milky Way. Um, so there's definitely some of this uh, kind of structure. 
But there's also been the question of whether there's also perhaps a kind of classical bulge structure in um, some of the stellar populations of the Milky Way. So if there's a classical bulge also embedded within the boxy peanut bulge. Now, because of the very um, different formation pathways for these different structures, they'll leave very different hemodynamical imprints on stellar populations. So we can um, go and study these and model the chemodynamical properties of the bulge to try and decipher its origin, to try and decipher how the Milky Way bulge formed and also how different stellar populations of the Milky Way bulge formed. So this is exactly what we wanted to do in this study. So we looked at five of the Auriga galaxies um, that have that form prominent boxy peanut bulges by redshift zero because the Milky Way has a prominent boxy peanut bulge at redshift zero. And we went and we studied the, in detail their chemodynamical properties. So this is what I'm going to show here. So uh, on the top panel, you have line of sight velocity. And on the bottom panel, you have velocity dispersion as a function of galactic longitude. And we're now separating stars into these three different metallicity bins. So and we're doing this first for the Milky Way. So what you can see in the Milky Way, this is from the Argos survey, is that um, metal rich stars, which are shown in red, um, and metal poor stars, which are shown in green, have very similar rotation properties, as do also this intermediate population shown in blue. Even though the metal poor population, the green one, has higher velocity dispersion. Now, if we go and look at um, the stellar populations in the simulations and look at them in the same way that we observe the Milky Way, this is what we get for one of the galaxies. So this is for Riga 18. So in the case of Riga 18, you see that the metal poor population shown in green has quite similar rotation to the metal rich population shown in red, even though it has a higher velocity dispersion. Now, if we go and look at another halo, for example, Auriga 26, here what we see is that the metal poor population is rotating much more slowly than the metal rich population, even though it has a higher velocity dispersion again. So what this is telling us is that the metal poor component um, has very different properties, chemokinematic properties, um, in the halos, depending on the formation history of each of these halos. And I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides. So this is what the kinematic properties look like in the five uh, halos that we explored. And I want you to notice that in the case of Auriga 17 and Auriga 18, these are the ones that are most similar to the Milky Way in the sense that the metal poor population has very similar rotation to the metal rich populations, which is what the Milky Way exhibits as well. Um, now, if we look at the morphology, into in these three different metallicity bins. So let's focus, for example, on Auriga 18. So red is again metal rich and green is metal poor. What we see is that um, if we look at the metal rich population, we see that there's a very prominent peanut shape, which becomes less prominent as we go to more and more metal poor um, populations. So we see that the morphology of the boxy peanut and of the bar is actually dependent on the velocity dispersion of the population. So we know that the, the metal poor populations have higher velocity dispersion, and so they have a less prominent peanut shape. And this was already shown also in these works back in 2017. Now, if we focus only on the metal poor population, what we see is that if we look at galaxies like Auriga 17 and 18, which have this highly rotating metal poor component, we see that the, the distribution of the stars is more flattened in this metal poor component and looks more like a thick disk. Whereas if we look at, for example, Auriga um, 26, where we have this um, very slowly rotating metal poor component, um, we see that the uh, distribution of stars is in a more sphroidal-like configuration. So what this is telling us is that metal poor populations, which have higher rotation, are also going to look more like flat and thick disk-like populations, which of course um, is as expected. Now, if we go and look at the formation history of these galaxies, so this I'm now I'm showing you this for Auriga 18. So this is the star formation rate as a function of look-back time. So high redshift again is on the left, and you see in black line the total star formation rate. And these lines at the top are showing you the um, uh, merges that happen in this galaxy with um, a mass higher than 10 to the 7. And the color coding is showing you the uh, mass ratio, the stellar mass ratio of the merger at the time that it happened. So what this tells you is that lighter lines means that this uh, merger was a, a more minor merger, uh, had a lower mass ratio, and darker lines will mean that this was a more massive major merger. Now, what you can see is that for Auriga 18, you have these very few mergers that happened since in the last 12 giga years of the evolution of the galaxy. And this is very similar also to what we see in Auriga 17. So you also see there are very few mergers that happened, and the ones that do happen are very low mass. Um, 
And this gives rise to this highly rotating metal pore component. If we go and look at the case of, for example, Auriga 26, where we have a, a, a slowly rotating metal pore component, you see that you have these very massive major mergers that have taken place in the last 12 giga years. And what happens there is that because the metal pore component is already formed, which is shown by the green line here, this is already formed by the time the merger happens. When the merger happens, because it's so massive, it disturbs the kinematical properties of the metal pore population in the bulge. So you end up with something that's dispersion dominated rather than a highly rotating component, like in the case of Auriga 17 or Auriga 18. So what this is telling us is that for Auriga bulges to have chemokinematic properties that are consistent with the Milky Way bulge, the last massive major merger in the galaxy has to have taken place at redshift above 3.5, so more than 12 giga years ago. So this places constraints on the mass of subsequent mergers, for example, the Gaia and Cella the Sausage merger, um, which our models suggest that has to have been around 1 to 20 or less. Um, so for example, in Auriga 18, you have a, a Gaia and Cella the Sausage-like merger happening at about 9 giga years ago, but this was at about 1 to 20 merger rather uh, than, for example, 1 to 10 merger. Now we can go and quantify this difference between the um, metal rich and the metal poor components in terms of kinematics. And we do this by, with this delta V parameter, which is the relative difference between the metal rich and the metal poor component. So on the bottom panel here, you have um, a metal poor and metal rich populations that rotate more similarly. And on the top, they rotate, um, uh, they have a larger difference between them. And on the X axis, you have this parameter here, which is quantifying the effect of mergers. So on the left, you have fewer mergers that happen at earlier times. And on the right, you have more mergers that, have, uh, that happen at later times. So they have a larger impact on the galaxy. This is just summing over mergers where you're summing over the mass ratio of the merger over the redshift at which it happens squared. And you see there's a trend here. So uh, galaxies that have had more massive mergers happening at later times have a larger difference between their metal rich and metal poor components compared to galaxies that have had fewer mergers um, at early times and that have a very similar metal rich and metal poor component in terms of the kinematics. So the Milky Way has values around somewhere around down here because it has a very similarly rotating metal rich and metal poor component. So if we continue this trend downwards, what it's telling us is that the Milky Way has had a very quiescent formation history. Um, so of all our 40 Riga galaxies, the most quiescent galaxy is kind of close to the Milky Way in terms of its chemodynamical properties to, to the Milky Way bulge. So this tells us that the Milky Way's formation history is very quiescent, and it really makes up the tail of the distribution of merger histories that are possible in Lambda CDM. Now, if we look at the XC2 fraction, so this is uh, shown in red here for the five galaxies that we looked at, we see that the XC2 fraction in the bulge um, is quite low in all of these five galaxies, but especially for the two galaxies that look the most like the Milky Way uh, from term, in terms of chemodynamics, area 17 and 18, you have a, a less than 1% of the star, stars that are formed XC2. So over 99% of the bulge in these two galaxies that look like the Milky Way have an in situ um, origin. If we look at um, the metal pore range, so from minus one to minus 0 0.5, in these two galaxies, Auriga 17 and 18, we still have a very low fraction of metal pore of, excuse me, of XC2 stars. So still most of the stars here are in C2, even in the most metal pore bin. We really have to go to even lower metallicities, so metallicity below minus one, to start to be able to actually probe um, higher fractions of XC2 stars in these kinds of galaxies, uh, which have these very quiescent merger histories. So what, um, to summarize, what this is telling us is that bars in cosmological simulations, um, we know are, are long-lived structures, um, and that for Milky Way mass galaxies, bars start forming at about redshift of one to two, so they're forming uh, quite early on. The Milky Way bulge itself is compatible with having an in situ thin and thick disk origin. So more than the galaxies in Auriga that are most compatible with the Milky Way have more than 99% of the stars in the bulge formed in C2. This implies that the Milky Way has had a very quiescent merger history that's really probing the tail of the distribution um, of merger histories that po that's possible for these kinds of Milky Way mass galaxies. And the last major merger must have happened about 12 giga years ago. And this places const upper constraints on the upper mass ratio of the Gaia and Solidus sausage merger of about one to 20. And we also find that the ex situ population of stars in Milky Way-like galaxies in the bulge um, becomes non-negligible only for metallicities below minus one. 
So what does this tell us about the formation and evolution of bulges? I think the main thing that it can tell us is that it is possible to form um, bulges or let's say inner regions in Milky Way mass galaxies within the Lambda-CDM paradigm that are really dominated by in situ populations, um, at least when we're looking at metallicities above minus one, which is where the bulk of the mass is. So it's, and in fact, it does seem that the Milky Way is just such a galaxy. So its bulge is basically just a thin and thick disk that looks like a bulge because it's been puffed up by the bar into a boxy peanut. Um, so it is basically just an in situ bulge with a very, very small fraction of XC2 stars. However, such quiescent merger histories are not the most common in Lambda CDM. So of course, this has leaves some open questions, which is how common is the Milky Way in terms of the properties of its bulge? And are there other galaxies with such low X2 fractions? Is this common in also external massive spirals? And if so, um, does this conspicuous lack of massive classical bulges um, present a challenge for Lambda CDM? So I'll leave this as open questions and I'm really looking forward to discussing more with you all on Slack and in the discussion sections. Thank you.